Greetings Warhammer enthusiast. Before you stands a voice assistant of the poor cast, dedicated to spreading the greater good. If you find this information useful, please do not hesitate to leave a like and subscribe. Together, we shall explore the depths of the Warhammer universe and share in its wonders. In the vast expanse of the galaxy, amidst the swirling tempests of the Great Rift, lies the imperial world of Vigilus. This planet holds a significance that belies its modest appearance, for Vigilus is situated within the Natchman Gauntlet, making it one of the scant pathways through the tumultuous Great Rift. As a result, this world has become a beacon, drawing attention not only from the mighty Imperium but also from its countless foes. This attention birthed a conflict now known as the War of Beasts, and later, when the malevolent forces of chaos descended, the War of Nightmares. The strategic importance of Vigilus cannot be understated. As one of the very few passages through the Great Rift, its possession would ensure control over crucial routes that crisscross the vast reaches of the galaxy. Naturally, the Imperium, ever vigilant in its defense of mankind's dominion over the stars, fortified Vigilus with countless defenses, garrisons, and formidable war machines. The world transformed into a bastion of human resilience, a symbol of the Emperor's might against the encroaching darkness. But with such prominence comes peril. Many were the enemies that cast their covetous gaze upon Vigilus. As the war drums sounded and fleets converged upon the planet, the War of Beasts began. The vast and foreboding expanse of the Great Rift cast a shadow over many worlds, but few would feel its effects as swiftly and severely as Vigilus. As the planet suffered, plagued by chilling nightmares, rampant riots, and eerie celestial anomalies linked to the Rift's emergence, an unanticipated menace loomed on the horizon, the Speed War. This colossal orc war, driven by the frenzied speed freaks, seemed to be expelled directly from the bowels of the rift. Without any predetermined target, fate had it that their attention was drawn to Vigilus. Its defenders, already grappling with the disorder following the rift's birth, found their psychic communication lines disrupted. Astropaths and psychers, whose visions could have provided warning, were left blinded by the chaotic energies. Unforeseen and unchallenged, the Orc fleet bypassed Vigilus' naval defenses. Desert expanses between Vigilus' hive sprawls became the landing zone for the Orc Armada. While the protective bubble-like force fields cushioned some, many Orc vessels met a fiery end upon impact. Yet from the wreckage and ruin, the Orc's indomitable spirit saw opportunity. The surviving vessels were repurposed, serving as the foundation for sprawling scrap cities, which soon dotted the desert landscape. These cities became bastions of orc activity, threatening the beleaguered planet. Vigilus defenders, still grappling with the chaos birthed by the Great Rift, remained paralyzed as these orc cities grew in their backyard. The calm before the storm shattered with the appearance of the orc speedboss Kruldaka, who led a vast armada of roaring bikes, sturdy trucks, and hulking wagons. Initially, the imposing bastion-class force fields that encircled each Vigilus hive sprawl kept the orc menace at bay. Frustrated, the Greenskins diverted their energies, raiding desert caravans and engaging in furious battles and races amidst the vast dust storm known as the Vulian Swirl. However, the planet's reprieve was short-lived. Intensifying warp storms associated with the growing Great Rift caused catastrophic failures in the force fields. The barriers that stood resiliently against the Orc onslaught crumbled. With their path clear, it took only a matter of hours for the Greenskin Horde to infiltrate the cities. They met fierce resistance from the Imperial Guard, the Sisters of Battle, and the Mechanicum Defenders, but the Orc Tide seemed unstoppable. Even the verdant biodome sprawl of Mortwald was not spared. Its prized rejuvenate complexes and lush forests faced desecration at the hands of the invaders. Deep in the cosmic yearning of Chancer's Vale, the Genestila cult known as the Pauper Princes dispatched a clutch of Genestilas to lay roots on the strategic world of Vigilus. Though many perished during their perilous journey, a lone Genestila endured, stealthily embedding itself in the cavernous depths beneath Megaborealis. Over time, this being expanded its influence, secretly converting followers and, as years turned to decades, grew into a mighty Genestila patriarch, adopting the title of Grand Sire Wong. With each passing generation, its cult expanded, spreading like a shadowy web of conspiracy beneath Vigilus' surface. 
the centuries rolled on, and as Vigilus faced the raucous onslaught of the orcs, the Genestila cult sensed an imminent danger to their plans. Fearful of their painstakingly crafted subterfuge being undone by the rampaging greenskins, the cultists decided to act. No longer would they skulk in the shadows. Grand Siawam, with its unparalleled strategic acumen, orchestrated insurrections within every hive sprawl. Dirkton's hive sprawl, the cult's primary stronghold, witnessed a series of synchronized ambushes that spoke of a well-coordinated uprising. Here, cultists had infiltrated deeply, outnumbering the faithful many times over. Using their influence over subverted planetary defense force regiments, they accessed Mechanicus controls, deactivating Dirkton's protective force field. To the Imperium, this appeared as a mere technical malfunction, but it was enough to send shockwaves of panic. Seizing the moment, the orcs launched an assault on the vulnerable hive sprawl. But the pauper princes were not done. With an uncanny ability to manipulate, they coerced a staggering 4,000 soldiers into the barren wastes, ensuring them of safety once the force fields were restored. But as these soldiers faced the overwhelming force of 15,000 orcs, the cultists initiated another uprising in Dirkton's central hive. Unprepared and defenseless, the governing bodies of Dirk Den crumbled. As the last line of defense faltered, the cultists reactivated the force fields, cruelly trapping the hapless guardsmen outside to meet their doom against the Orc Horde. Those who managed to escape this betrayal fled Dirk Den, but in their haste, they inadvertently transported concealed Genestila cultists to neighboring hive sprawls. The Otek hive sprawl would soon experience the pauper prince's wrath. This region was coveted by the cult, primarily for its abundant water supply. Engaging in fierce combat, the cultists eventually claimed Otek's reservoirs, corrupting its pristine waters with their insidious genetic taint. The pauper prince's rise to power was not just a tale of treachery, it showcased their unmatched ability to strategize, manipulate, and influence, proving that sometimes the deadliest threats come not from without, but from within. Vigilus found its pleas falling on deaf ears within the corridors of its own imperial government. Dismissing the growing Genestila uprising as mere acts of criminality, they confidently believed the Adeptus Arbites would reign in the unrest. This complacency had repercussions, as Vigilus bustling industries suffered, with export routes cut off and resource convoys halted. The persistent orc raids further aggravated this grim scenario, ensuring that Vigilus became a planet on the brink. One of the many clashes, the battle for the seeping delta, bore witness to the might of the Mechanicus Scitarii battling amidst rivers of industrial discharge. The scale was unimaginable, with both sides suffering casualties in the millions. Just as it seemed the tides of war would not favor any, Fabricator Vosh of the Mechanicum played his hand. Deploying an army of 600 Cataphran breaches, he set the delta ablaze, turning the battleground into a fiery inferno consuming both ally and foe. Hope, in the form of reinforcements, manifested with the arrival of the Iron Hands and their successor chapter, the Brazen Claws. Initially destined for the Stygius Crusade, they altered their course upon comprehending the gravity of the situation faced by their Mechanicum allies on Vigilus. Commanded by Cardan Stronos, a revered figure amongst the Iron Hands, they initiated a precision strike. Drop pods descended on the outskirts of every imperial hive sprawl, with a key focus on Megaborealis. Expecting to clash with orcs, the space marines were met with the twisted forms of Genestilas. Meanwhile, efforts by the Imperial Guard and the Sisters of Battle to counter the Genestila threat frequently ended in tragedy, with their convoys ensnared by treacherous sinkholes, only to face the horrors lurking below. The Genestilas, taking advantage of the distracted air defenses, further entrenched themselves within the hive sprawls. Yet another chapter of Space Marines, the ferocious Space Wolves, led by Halder Icepelt, joined the fray. Their entry onto the battlefield was several heartbeats after the Iron Hands. With a singular focus, they embarked on a brutal campaign to rid the Otek hive sprawl of the Xeno's plague. Communication was scant between the Space Wolves and the Iron Hands, their strategies independent and their intent clear. Neither of the chapters felt the need to engage with Vigilus ruling council, as they unleashed their own brands of fury and retribution upon the foes of the Imperium. 
Within the fortified boundaries of the Mechanicum stronghold of Megaborealis, confidence ran high, perhaps too high. Hive Celerus was led by the prominent Magos Dominus, Ipluvius XIV. Consumed by his studies and with an unwavering faith in his stronghold's defenses, he remained oblivious to the looming storm. This complacency paved the way for a cunning band of Orc commandos to slip through, quickly identifying and exploiting a chink in the mighty force fields of the hive sprawl. The resulting onslaught was swift and brutal, led by the frenzied Orc speed freaks. As if that wasn't enough, the fortifications echoed with the rise of the Genestila cultists, known as the Claw of the Thirsting WIRM. Guided by the visionary Slygax the Prophet, the cultists orchestrated a devastating strike, purloining Vortex missiles and setting them off at the very heart of the hive sprawl. The resulting devastation crippled many of the defenses, notably bringing down the mighty warlord titan, Dominus Rex. In the wake of this chaos, Archmago's Nisium Cauldrike stepped forward, placing the paralyzed Epluvius XIV in stasis and assuming command. Demonstrating remarkable leadership, Cauldrike collaborated closely with the Iron Hand's Cargill clan. Within the vast technological labyrinths of Megaborealis, a fierce battle raged between the Imperials and the insidious Genestila cultists. The Astartes took the lead, forging pathways through the cultist ranks. They were a sight to behold, each Astartes clad in imposing power armor, their presence enough to instill fear in the heart of the enemy. Behind them, the Mechanicum, guardians of the Imperium's arcane technology, would sweep through, ensuring no trace of the Genestila taint remained. With their advanced Xenos identifying instruments, they efficiently rooted out Genestila nests, forcing the subversive pauper princes into a defensive stance. Gone were the days of their unchecked dominance. Now, they were compelled to adopt guerrilla tactics, striking from the shadows before disappearing once more. Yet, in the vastness of Megaborealis, there were pockets of resistance that would not be so easily subdued. The Stygian spires, towering edifices that controlled the asteroid's critical water mining operations, became the focal point of the Genestila's ambitions. At the helm of this clandestine assault was the shrewd Genestila Primus, Deathru Noan. Unlike many of his kin, Noan approached the conflict with a strategist's mind rather than the fervor of a fanatic. He realized the importance of the spires. Deprive the Mechanicum of their water source, and the entire Imperial effort could be compromised. In a bid to strengthen his assault, Noan sought the alliance of Magus Slinte, a mastermind in his own right. Their partnership bore fruit when they enlisted the formidable Grand Sire Worm, the Genestila Patriarch to lead the attack on the Stygian spires. The combined might of their forces was overwhelming, and in a blitzkrieg attack launched from the spires' depths, the initial Skitarii defenders found themselves overrun. Grand Sire Worm's strategy was both brilliant and audacious. Instead of a frontal assault, he and his brood of purest rain genestilas opted for subterfuge. They journeyed through the water pipes of the spire, enduring the crushing pressure and claustrophobic confines for what seemed like an eternity. But their endurance was rewarded. Emerging on the other side, they found the upper echelons of the spire largely undefended, the Skitarii forces having been drawn to the lower levels. With a fury only a Genestila Patriarch could muster, Worm and his kin took control of the upper levels, establishing a significant foothold within the Stygian spires. The battle for Megaborealis had taken a dire turn, and the fate of its water supply hung in the balance. The Imperium would need to muster all its strength and strategy to reclaim the precious resource and push back the Genestila threat. In parallel, the Imperial Guard mounted a significant counter-offensive, with aerial support in the form of Valkyrie and Vendetta squadrons from the Imperial Navy. Their mission was multifaceted, safeguarding vital supply routes, escorting fuel convoys, and most importantly, bolstering the defenses of Megaborealis. The ground thundered as armored convoys of Lehman Russ battle tanks and Chimeras rolled out, decimating the orc foes they encountered, aided immeasurably by their artillery support. Yet, every victory seemed to call forth even greater numbers of orc speed freaks, eventually overpowering the beleaguered Imperial Guard. The Battle of Morning Gorge became emblematic of these shifting fortunes. Here, the 121st Goliath Armored Battle Group met its doom at the hands of the audacious orc speedster, Fragbad Squigbiter. 
In an act of sheer recklessness, Squigbiter launched an assault on a Death Strike missile using just stick bombs. The resulting explosion not only obliterated the battle group, but also severed a vital supply route, leading to the encirclement of Storval. The labyrinthine alleys and vaulted chambers of hive sprawled Ontoria were no strangers to tension. The ever-teeming populace of the slums felt an even more palpable dread as rumors of unknown raiders whispered throughout the lower depths, which later would be unveiled as the nefarious Dark Eldar. Just when Dontoria's denizens thought things couldn't get worse, alarm sounded as an unidentified vessel tore through the skies, crashing into the heart of the hive sprawl, releasing a plague unlike any other, the Gelapox infected. But this was merely the harbinger of an even more terrifying force. The pestilent and notorious Death Guard followed in the wake of the infected, their presence signifying doom. The stalwart defenders, the tempestuous scions of the 98th Lambdic Oxen and the vigilant arbitrators, managed to repel the infected. However, against the relentless advance of the Chaos Space Marines, they found themselves overpowered. Facing the grim reality of their situation, Tempest Aeneid made the harrowing decision to firebomb the lower levels. While it initially appeared as though the infection had been contained, a virulent plague soon emerged creeping throughout Dontoria's districts, signaling that Nurgle's malevolent grip hadn't been broken. The warnings of rogue trader Delarique du Languil, seasoned in the knowledge of such plagues, fell on the deaf ears of the Aquilarian Council, leading to further delay in action. The Gelapox infection had made its home here, turning men and machinery alike into monstrous parodies of their former selves. The sickly pallor of corruption seemed unstoppable until the ominous shadows of the Necropolis Hawks a chapter of primary space marines, descended upon the city. In their sleek, death-themed armor, the hawks moved like wraiths, each step calculated, every swing of their weapon deadly. Their reputation for dealing with the corrupt and the undead was legendary, and they intended to use every ounce of that experience in Dontoria. Allying with them was the enigmatic rogue trader Du Languil, a seasoned traveler of the galaxy's darkest corners, bringing knowledge of foes beyond comprehension. As the Necropolis Hawks delved deeper into the infected zones, they encountered scenes from nightmares. Mutated beings, a vile combination of machine and flesh, wandered the streets, their glistening forms belying the infectious horrors that lurked within. The challenge was immense, but the marines pressed on, their bolters barking out death with every pull of the trigger. Yet the battle was far from singular. Another renowned chapter, the Crimson Fists, led by the indomitable Captain Germans, collaborated with the stoic and methodical Iron Hands. Their combined mission was of paramount importance a containment. With the infection spreading, their aim was to create a barrier that the contagion could not cross. Their efforts converged at the decommissioned litmus dock. Here, amidst the vast shipyards and rusting behemoths of a bygone era, they faced off against the Jellapox-infected Chaos Mutants. The screams of battle echoed off the metal walls as the marines, their power armor gleaming in the sporadic lighting, met their foes with brutal precision. The Iron Hands, known for their mastery of machine and strategy, proposed a radical solution to contain the spread. Utilizing the vast Promethean pipelines that wound their way through Dontoria, they planned to create a blazing barrier around the heart of the infection. The Crimson Fists, ever the champions in dire situations, took the lead. With the support of the Vigilant Guard's Hellhounds, they ignited the Prometheum. Fire roared to life, consuming everything in its path and turning the skyline into a blazing inferno. It was a sight both awe-inspiring and terrifying, an entire section of the city, encircled by flames, keeping the darkness at bay. The firewall was a testament to the lengths the Imperium would go to protect its own a beacon of defiance against the encroaching darkness. The marines, their armor stained with ash and battle, stood vigilant, ever watchful for any sign of the infection trying to breach their fiery fortress. In the bustling streets of Otek Hive Sprawl, the space wolves found themselves battling for a cause greater than just reclaiming territory. They were fighting to secure the precious water supply from the clutches of the Genestila forces. Every corner held a potential skirmish, every shadow a lurking menace. As they navigated the twisting alleyways, an unforeseen betrayal struck the wolves' ranks. The 14th Vigilant, Morningstar's artillery regiment, previously believed to be allies, revealed their true colors. 
controlled by the insidious Genestealers, they used their knowledge of the Hive Sprawl's architecture to devastating effect. Expertly placed demolition charges sent colossal structures crashing down, attempting to bury the walls beneath tons of rubble, and setting the stage for waves of Genestela monstrosities to finish what the regiment had started. But the walls were made of sterner stuff. Many of their brothers lay dead or trapped, but they weren't about to be defeated. With their exceptional senses heightened in the dire circumstances, they followed the scent and trail of the Genestela leaders. Every step was fraught with danger as ambushes and traps sought to ensnare them, turning their hunt into a perilous game of survival. After what felt like an eternity of cat and mouse, the wolves managed to corner their foes, the claws of the thirsting WYRM. Leading their counterattack was the formidable Redemptor Dreadnought, Asker the Frozen. With every swing and strike, Genestealers met their end. But even in their final moments, the Genestealers proved cunning, setting off a series of explosives in a last-ditch attempt to eliminate their hunters. Halder, seeing the impending chaos, quickly devised a bold strategy. Rather than avoiding the explosions, he saw an opportunity to use them to the wolves' advantage. Rallying his brothers, he issued a rapid order to locate additional explosive caches throughout the hive sprawl. The plan was audacious, to detonate them simultaneously, causing vast sections of the city to crumble and fall into the waters below. This would not only drown countless Genestela monstrosities but also halt the spread of the water's infected taint, ensuring the safety of countless Imperials who depended on its supply. Simultaneously, far beyond the confines of Vigilus, Marnius Kalgar, the venerable leader of the Ultramarines, was beckoned by a dream vision. Projected by Chief Librarian Tigurius, the vision bore a decree from Robout Gilliman, Vigilus must not fall. Guided by Tigurius' mental prowess, the Ultramarines embarked on the perilous journey to Vigilus. The ritualistic connection proved dangerous, claiming several epistolaries in the process. Yet, their sacrifices ensured that the Ultramarines reached Vigilus in the nick of time. Upon landing, Kalgar made his way to Saint Haven to meet with the Aquilarian Council. But, with his honed senses, he instantly discerned treachery. Many among the Council bore the taint of the Genestela cultists. Without hesitation, Kalgar's accompanying Marines executed the traitors in their midst. The once esteemed Aquilarian Council was disbanded, and under Kalga's decisive leadership, the Vigilus Senate was born. The skies over the vast expanses of Hyperia and Otec Hive sprawls darkened as the insidious forces of the Dark Eldar descended. They came not just as mere raiders, but as the embodiment of terror and agony. Their attacks, characterized by sadistic joy and overwhelming cruelty, were aptly named the Carnivals of Pain. These were not mere skirmishes, but grand spectacles of torment and despair. These carnivals were a malevolent blend of the different Dark Eldar factions. Cabalite warriors, armed with dark light weapons and blades, moved in deadly unison, striking from the shadows. The WYCH cults, graceful and deadly in their combat dance, left a trail of opponents entranced and then butchered. Among the most terrifying were the monstrous creations of the Himonculi, grotesque experiments crafted from flesh and pain. They lumbered forth, their mere presence sending shivers of dread through even the bravest of hearts. But even amidst this diverse and fearsome horde, one group stood out, commanding respect and evoking fear even within the ranks of the Dark Eldar, the Himonculi Coven of the Altered. Their presence on the battlefield was not just a matter of random choice. They had a score to settle, a vendetta to fulfill. The Altered bore a deep-seated grudge against the Ultramarines, one of the most celebrated Space Marine chapters. In a distant confrontation during the Indomitus Crusade, they had tasted bitter defeat at the hands of the very Primarch of the Ultramarines, Robout Gilliman. Now, they sought retribution. The Dark Eldar's raiding prowess was evident in their tactics. Swift and efficient, they struck with such ferocity that entire sections of the hive sprawls fell before they could even muster a defense. It was during one of these lightning-fast assaults that they achieved a feat that would become whispered in the darkest corners of the Imperium. Several squads of ultramarines, the stalwart defenders of humanity, were ambushed, overwhelmed, and captured. To the horror of their kin, they were shackled and dragged into the webway, destined for the dark city of Komarak where they would face unimaginable horrors. 
on the distant Eldar craft world of Siamhan, Farseer Anver Keltok stood before the Seer Council, his voice filled with urgency. He spoke of the world of Vigilus, not directly connected to the Eldar, but of vital importance to the intricate webs of fate they were woven into. Through his visions, Keltok revealed a chilling prophecy, the rise of Vanadan the Firebrand, a Tsientian Chaos cult leader, poised to unleash catastrophic destruction by triggering a magma eruption in Storval. This volcanic fury would ripple through the depths and culminate beneath Saint's Haven, annihilating Vigilus War Council and altering the fate of the galaxy. Persuaded by Keltok's forewarning, the Seer Council granted their aid, entrusting the mission to Autark Rylor and Spirit Seer Kelinaris. With a select strike force at their side, they set forth, weaving their way through the cosmos using the intricate pathways of the webway, careful to avoid the treacherous Dark Eldar lurking in the shadows near Vigilus. Upon emerging from the webway, they pinpointed the location where Vanadan was set to deliver his blasphemous sermon. The Eldar strike force, swift as the wind, descended upon Vanadan and his followers, leaving a trail of death in their wake. The firebrand's flame was extinguished, but their actions did not go unnoticed. Reports of the Eldar's presence reached the vigilant ears of the Imperials. Misinformed, they mistook these Eldar warriors for the same Dark Eldar who had tormented them throughout the war. The citizenry was in panic, fearing an Eldar onslaught. Reacting to the perceived threat, the 47th Antrell Lion stormtroopers were dispatched with haste. Upon their arrival, the scene was one of chaos. The stormtroopers saw only Xenos and reacted, striking without hesitation. Kelinaris, desperate to avoid unnecessary bloodshed, tried to reason with them, but his words fell on deaf ears. In the ensuing clash, the valiant Autark Rylor met a grim fate, struck down amidst the chaos. Spirit Seer Kelinaris, heart heavy with grief and anger, rallied the surviving Eldar and retreated to the relative safety of the webway. Swearing vengeance upon those who had wronged them, he returned to Siamhan, bearing the spirit stones of Rylor and other fallen comrades. In a Samba ritual, they were imbued within wraithbone shells, fusing their souls with towering constructs. When Kelinaris finally set foot on Vigilus again, he was not alone. With him marched an imposing force of both living warriors and spectral wraith constructs, hungry for retribution. Water, the elixir of life, was becoming a rarity on Vigilus. The fall of the Otec water supply was a blow that rippled across the world, and now the vast expanse of Lake Dante in Dontoria teetered on the brink. Every droplet was invaluable, every reservoir eyed with suspicion and fear of contamination. But water wasn't the sole concern for the embattled world. The sprawling farms and vast production facilities of Mortwald, the Grand False Continent, were the lifeline for many. This was where food and medicine took root and flourished, sustaining countless lives. However, the shadow of the orcs and the Genestealers cast a pall over the land, threatening to strangle its vital lifelines. Yet Mortwald was no defenseless realm. It was a bastion of resilience, home to some of the finest warriors the Imperium had to offer. From the elite Ventrillian nobles with their regal stature and unmatched discipline, to the stoic Vostroyan firstborn whose heritage in battle was unparalleled, and even the survivors of the legendary Cadian shock troopers, who had seen their home shattered but remained unbowed. They rallied under the banner of Lord Danos, brother to the governor of Vigilus and a leader whose voice inspired trust. When the clarion call of war resounded, and Mortwald found itself besieged, its defenses held firm. Trenches, dug deep and fortified, became walls of resistance against the orcs. Every wave of the green tide was met with a hail of gunfire, every charge repelled with calculated precision. The tactical prowess of the guardsmen was evident in their ability to adapt, reposition, and hold their ground, even in the face of overwhelming odds. The Genestealers, with their insidious tactics, too found themselves thwarted in the ejector districts. And throughout this relentless conflict, a single mantra resonated across Mortwald, a beacon of hope for all, Mortwald would not fall. Hope was reinforced with the arrival of the Imperial Fist's Fifth Company. Led by the stern and strategic Captain Dravastis Fane, these space marines were the embodiment of fortification. They brought with them not just the might of their arms, but the wisdom of their architects. 
enhancing Mortwald's defenses, they turned the continent into an impenetrable fortress. Yet, the war was far from over. The ground shook as orc stompers, towering monstrosities of metal and fury, stormed the plains of Mortwald by the hundreds. Fane, ever the tactician, knew that direct confrontation was suicide. He ordered a strategic retreat to higher ground, luring the stompers into a trap. And just when the situation seemed dire, the thundering hooves of loyalist knights echoed across the horizon. From the noble house Daravar, led by Joran van Aklimters, to the revered house Terin, these towering war machines bolstered the defenses of Mortwald. The landscapes of Vigilus had long been marred by war, but the clash that followed between the towering machines of humanity and the monstrous contraptions of the orcs would echo for eons. The knights of Daravar and Terin, backed by the very might of the Reaver Titan Heresium's bane, launched into the heart of the Greenskin Horde, a tidal wave of steel and firepower crashing against the relentless green tide. Danos, always placing the safety of the people above all else, pulled back the Imperials' advance even when the orcs seemed on the verge of breaking. The safeguarding of Mortwald was paramount. However, this reprieve was brief, for the orcs returned with an almost clockwork determination. Each assault, more potent than the last, saw the introduction of larger and more terrifying war machines. These orcish titans, shadowing even the Reaver titans in stature, made it clear that a new strategy was required. Captain Dravastis Fane, ever the forward thinker, pinpointed the root of the problem. The orcs were manufacturing these colossal war beasts at an alarming rate. The decision was clear, is strike at the heart. The factories that birthed these behemoths had to be silenced. And so, with a determination that could move mountains, Fane spearheaded an assault, accompanied by the knights and titans, into the wastelands of Vigilus in search of the heart of the orcish war machine. Their first significant encounter, now famously known as the Battle of Tanker Spill, would go down in imperial records as a masterstroke of strategy and valor. A vast orc scrap city sprawled in the east of Mortwald, and the knights of Daravar, with their titans in tow, used the land itself to their advantage. Approaching from the intricate trench networks, they timed their assault with a raging dust storm. Like phantoms, they emerged from the blinding haze, wreaking havoc on the unsuspecting orc lines. Their sudden appearance created chaos among the orcs. Confusion reigned supreme as the green skins struggled with the decision to either face the newfound threat from behind or continue their charge ahead. In this orchestrated disarray, the Warhound Titans, agile and devastating, laid waste to the orcs and the factories that dotted the landscape. Yet the battle was far from over. With their primary objective achieved, Captain Fane ordered a tactical withdrawal. However, the knights, their spirits aflame with zeal and vengeance, chose to press on, taking the fight to the very heart of another scrap city. They became legends in that hour, cleaving through thousands of orcs, their advance seeming unstoppable. But the orcs are not to be underestimated. Their numbers, endless and ferocious, began to encircle the indomitable knights. Space marines weren't about to abandon their knights to the overwhelming tide of orcs. Captain Fane, resolute and fierce, rallied his brethren and prepared for an audacious airborne assault. They were joined by the swift white scars, led by the fearless Elugian Khan, and the mysterious Ravenwing strike force under the guidance of Menarius. The skies roared as the combined might of these forces, bolstered by the bombers of the Imperial Navy, descended upon the besieged location of the knights. Khan's Stormtail and gunships weaved through the airspace, masterfully exploiting any gaps in the orc air defenses. With their rapid maneuvers, they pinpointed and obliterated the orc artillery, leaving the Xeno's ranks exposed. The ground beneath trembled as white scars and raven-winged bikers stormed through, their bikes roaring like thunder, their blades shimmering with intent. Their main objective, to reach the encircled knights and break their encirclement. But amidst the swirling chaos of battle, a sudden and unexpected maneuver unfolded. The Ravenwing, in a fleeting decision, broke from the engagement, darting towards the enigmatic Vulian swirl. Their sudden departure left a gaping void in the Imperial battle line, and the White Scars, despite their valiant efforts, found themselves cornered by the unrelenting Orc onslaught. Alujin Khan, recognizing the dynas of the situation and ever the pragmatist, gave the command to retreat. 
the disappearance of the Dark Angels and their Ravenwing to serve some inscrutable purpose was a bitter pill to swallow, but survival took precedence. Back on Vigilus, the Vigilus Senate under the leadership of Kalgar was steering the war effort with commendable finesse. The mood amongst the populace was one of cautious optimism. They began to harbor the belief that their beloved planet could indeed be wrested back from the myriad threats that besieged it. However, Kalgar, with his centuries of experience, recognized when a situation was spiraling beyond control. The strategic evaluation of Dirk Den deemed it unwinnable, at least for the time being. Instead of squandering lives in a futile attempt, Kalgar made the heart-wrenching decision to evacuate Dirk Den civilians. As these denizens were ushered to safety, the Crimson Fists, ever the valiant shield of the Imperium, formed a protective barrier against the rampaging hordes of Kruldaka's orcs, allowing the masses to withdraw in relative safety.